Okay, um, so this is, this is going to be the last uh, lecture. Um, so let me, uh, let me talk in the remaining time about uh, the analyzed method of moments uh, and empirical likelihood uh, methods. So um, what I'm going to do is just, um, after the introduction, talk a little bit about uh, GMM uh, methods. Uh, we sort of have been around in, the, in pretty much the same form since uh, Hansen's uh, 82 paper. Uh, um, then I'll talk about empirical likelihood, which is something that's sort of started in the early to mid-90s. Uh, talk about some computational issues here, there and illustrate this with some, uh, some panel data, with a, uh, sort of with a panel data model of the type that uh, Jeff was talking about um, on Monday. Um, so, so GMM has, has clearly been incredibly influential sort of as a general framework uh, for for estimation and inference uh, since uh, Hansen's paper where he, sort of, he kind of showed the set up the general uh, framework for that. And so one, one obvious reason for that is that just many st many estimators, many models uh, uh, we use uh, fit into that uh, that framework, and so this gives a very very nice uh, unified framework for analyzing a lot of uh, of, of methods. So that you can think of uh, you can make a distinction between two uh, cases. One, the the case the just identified case where there's a the number of moment uh, conditions is equal to the number of uh, unknown parameters. In this case, you just set the average uh, of the moments uh, equal to zero, average over the sample. Uh, of the observations. Um, and second, uh, the over-identified case sort of where, where Hansen's uh, uh, proposal was to, to use a two-step two method where first you get a consistent estimator, you use that to estimate the optimal weight matrix for the moment uh, and then get, a, get an efficient estimator in the second step. And sort of this, this for this over-identified case, Empirical likelihood uh, uh, provides an alternative, uh, and sort of uh, an alternative that sort of that on theoretical grounds really seems to have much more attractive properties uh, than uh, than these two-step methods. In some sense, it's a little bit like the the difference between uh, two states least squares and uh, and limel. And so, in the end, sort of all the the theoretical advantages are in favor of the, the empirical likelihood methods relative uh, to these two-step methods. So let me, let me kind of take a comparison with limit and two states least squares to kind of uh, clarify some of the, the comments I made. So in, in the end, where I came down was that, that all the theoretical advantages uh, where there are any differences uh, seem to be in favor of, uh, of limit. But it's, uh, certainly, uh, there may well be practical advantages to two states least squares, and there, may, there certainly are a lot of settings where it's not going to matter very much uh, in cases with, with, where the instruments are very strong, so where it may not make all that much difference. But my claim was, was, was sort of more precisely that I didn't see any theoretical reasons for, for ever using uh, two states least squares, but someone pointed out that um, in state of, for example, in the clustering was, was not implemented with limo, but was with two states least squares. And that, that certainly seems a very practical reason. And in a setting where you would expect it to make very little difference, I, I can certainly see the argument for using that. Uh, but that, that is distinct from the point I was trying to make, that at least theoretically, I don't see the, uh, didn't see any reason for, for using two states least squares. And similarly here, I'll, I'll make the case that I don't see any theoretical reason for using these two-step estimators. And that's a fairly safe claim in the sense that these two-step estimators have, just have a large arbitrary component to them. In the end, they rely on using some consistent estimator to get an estimate of the optimal weight matrix. But it, the implication of that is uh, that two researchers with the same data and the same moment conditions may validly end up with different point estimates. They use a different in the initial weight matrix end up with a different uh, consistent estimator in the, in the first stage. As a result, end up with a slightly different uh, estimate of the optimal weight matrix, and you end up with an, uh, a different uh, eventual estimate. And so it's sort of clear that it's, it's much more attractive to have a procedure that is invariant uh, 
nah, to starting values. Uh, and so they have a nah, procedure sort of like LIMO that is based on a likelihood function where two researchers with the same data nah, should end up with the same numbers. And similarly here, empirical likelihood essentially is going to set up an objective function that will give you, nah, that doesn't require an arbitrary choice uh, in the beginning. Even though in lots of cases that may not make uh, much of a difference, taking away the, uh, this, uh, these arbitrary choices where we have no theoretical reason to make uh, one rather than uh, the other, and we have no way of, of sort of communicating and, and universal way of choosing this, uh, sort of always gives the, the advantage to, to something like um, empirical likelihood uh, or, or limit type things. Then it turns out there's actually various versions of these uh, empirical likelihood type estimators, the differences of a very different, uh, of a different qualitative nature than, than uh, choosing a first stage uh, weighting matrix. Um, and so there's a couple of different uh, of these empirical likelihood estimators that uh, people have looked at. Um, and they, they, there it's been le there's less clarity over which one uh, should be preferred but my sense is that the, the choice between them is, uh, is much less important than the choice between the, the, uh, the generalized empirical likelihood class, uh, as, as Newey and Smith uh, call it, and, uh, and two-step uh, GMM. Um, sort of a little bit like uh, the difference between limel and two-stage least squares, these uh, empirical likelihood estimators um, can be computationally more demanding, uh, and, um, I'm not sure. I, th I think there's some programs out there that, that have implemented these things, uh, but it, uh, this, it's certainly clear what what the most effective ways are, are of uh, of implementing these uh, these methods, and, and in practice, they don't tend to be uh, computationally any more complicated uh, than uh, than standard uh, GMM. So let me uh, then set up uh, the, the the general problem. Uh, so um, we're interested in estimating a factor of parameters uh, theta. We don't know what the value of the true value theta star is. Uh, um, we have a random factor z, um, and we have a moment. We have a moment function um, that is a function of the random variable and the unknown parameter that we know has expectation zero at the true value of the parameter, and has expectation different from zero at, at any other value. And we have some random sample of uh, of this uh, of the z's. So I'm just looking at the cross-section case, the independent uh, case, but it, this, this could include panel data where the, the, C, the factor C includes uh, various uh, lagged values of, uh, of some outcome. And so just to, to, to support the, the claim earlier that this is sort of a very general setup that, it fit, that a lot of standard things fit into that, uh, maximum likelihood fits into that, where you take as the moment condition the, the score function, the derivative uh, of the, the log of the, the density function, with sort of sta standard uh, likelihood theory. If you look at the score function, it has expectation zero uh, at the true value of the parameter and shouldn't have expectation zero anywhere else. And so this is actually useful, so it can be useful to interpret this in a method of moment setting because it's, it's sort of one way of, uh, of deriving the distribution of the maximum likelihood estimator under misspecification, can, which was done for this, this particular case in, uh, in White's paper, but you, you can, which would now sort of just be an immediate uh, result of, of standard DMM uh, theory. Another example is just linear, uh, sort of linear instrumental variables. Uh, we, you have a set of instruments uh, that's uncorrelated with the residual uh, and so if uh, the dimension of uh, C is greater than the dimension of X, uh, we're, we're in the over-identified case where with uh, more moments than, uh, than unknown parameters. Um, last example, and th this is sort of an uh, example I'm going to come back to and, uh, and look at some uh, simulations for. Here's a panel data model with an individual permanent component, eta i, and a, a lag dependent variable uh, theta, and uh, where epsilon it is uh, mean zero given, uh, given lagged values. Uh, and so in this case, we can, 
construct moment conditions uh, of, uh, of the following type where we difference the data um, and then use uh, the subsequent lags as, uh, to construct moment conditions. If you also uh, assume that the initial condition is drawn from the stationary long run distribution, you get an additional set of moment conditions. And so in principle, you can have a fairly large degree of uh, over-identification here with, with only a single uh, parameter if you have a reasonably large number of, uh, of time periods. Okay, so um, having motivated the general setup uh, in this case, uh, so what do we do in, um, in this setting? If uh, the dimension of uh, psi, the moment, uh, the factor of moment conditions is equal to the dimension of the, the unknown parameter theta, you can just typically estimate theta by just uh, setting the average moments uh, equal to zero. And so and the standard regularity conditions that will be that are estimated will be unique in large samples and consistent uh, for theta. In, uh, that's a little different if uh, we have more moment conditions than, uh, than unknown parameters, then you can't in general solve this, uh, uh, that set of equations because we would have more equations uh, than unknowns. And so Hansen's uh, solution to that was to minimize this quadratic, fo quadratic form in the average moments, uh, take some uh, positive definite uh, matrix C, and, uh, take the inner product of the average moments uh, uh, with that quadratic form, in the, in the form of that, uh, that quadratic form, and then minimize uh, uh, that. If we do that uh, for an arbitrary positive definite matrix C, you get a consistent estimator for, uh, for theta star. Um, and you get an asymptotic, you get root and consistency, asymptotic normal distribution with a, a very messy uh, variance covariance matrix kind of consisting of this uh, product of these uh, uh, 11 uh, matrices uh, where delta is the expected value of the outer product and gamma is the expected value of the, of the derivatives. So if you actually did this in the case where the, the model was just identified, then both gamma, then gamma would be a square matrix and it would actually be invertible. And so the whole thing collapses, C drops out, and you would get back to the inverse of gamma prime delta inverse gamma, irrespective of, uh, of the choice of, uh, of C. Um, that's a little different in the case where in, uh, with over-identification, at that point, the, the choice of, uh, of the weight matrix C is actually important, and the optimal choice for, for C is uh, the, the inverse of the covariance matrix of the moments, so, which, which makes uh, perfect sense. You give more weight to moments that have a low variance than to uh, do moments that have, uh, have a high variance. If you do that, if you use the optimal weight matrix uh, in, uh, in that uh, quadratic form you're minimizing, you get uh, the, the, SM, that, uh, the previous formula for the variance simplifies, and now, in general, it's the inverse of uh, gamma prime delta inverse uh, gamma. That, that is not directly feasible, because in, in practice, we don't know what, uh, what delta is, um, and so we can't minimize the quadratic form. And so there, uh, Hansen's solution, is it a, is it in, the, in the spirit of, uh, of three states least squares, it's in, uh, and GLS type uh, methods was to, uh, to estimate the optimal weight matrix. And so here, that is slightly more complicated because the weight matrix depends on unknown parameters. So the, the specific feasible solution is to first get a consistent estimator by using some arbitrary weight matrix, uh, say the identity matrix, and just take the first couple of uh, moments, uh, but get a consistent estimator, use that to estimate the the optimal weight matrix uh, by averaging the outer product of that uh, and use that estimated weight matrix uh, as the, uh, use that estimated covariance matrix as the weight matrix, and then minimize the quadratic form with that. It turns out that uh, the resulting estimator has the same first order asymptotic distribution as the one that uses the, the optimal weight matrix, namely this gamma prime delta inverse gamma uh, inverted uh, uh, irrespective of, uh, of the way you're estimating that uh, the weight matrix as long as you have a consistent uh, estimator for that. 
And so the same way uh, in two states least squares, you get the same asymptotic distribution as you get if you had the optimal uh, linear combination of, uh, of the instruments. Now, at the same time, it's sort of clear that in finite samples, this, this may well uh, be an issue. And so much the same way uh, there's issues with, with two states least squares, if you have a high degree of over-identification, uh, this approximation, this first order approximation, this particular first order approximation may not work very well if there's a large degree of, uh, of over-identification. Um, just two other uh, comments uh, here. In addition to uh, doing estimation here, we can actually test the moment conditions if there's uh, over-identification by just looking at the, the quadratic form. And so the way, the, uh, given the normalization I used, you can just directly look at the quadratic form evaluated at uh, the DMM estimates. And uh, under the null that all these moments have expectation zero, they should have a chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the, to the number of over-identifying restrictions, uh, m minus k in this uh, notation. So you, if you get a very large value for that, you would reject the uh, null hypothesis that all the moments uh, have expectation zero. Now, so the second point, and, and that's, that's, that may be slightly less uh, uh, well known, is that even when you think about this two-step estimator, you can rewrite that as a just-identified GMM estimator by augmenting the... the parameter f uh, vector. So you can fix an arbitrary, fix this matrix C, then you can think of the, of the initial estimate uh, here as estimating a parameter beta, uh, estimating the, the uh, variance covariance matrix of the moments uh, delta, and estimating the, the derivative of the moments uh, gamma, stacking this whole set of moment conditions here in combination with this whole set of uh, parameters. Uh, so we're now, in addition to theta, we have the, um, this matrix gamma, this matrix delta, um, the matrix lambda, and the additional parameter beta. And we have a, a set of uh, four, I mean, a set of moment conditions cons consisting of four, uh, of four parts. But in the end, this gives us a just identified system where all the, the methods we can apply to just identified systems can now be used to apply to, uh, to over identified systems. And so, in particular, you could get the asymptotic uh, variance covariance matrix for theta under general misspecification of the moment conditions by just writing it in this way and, and looking at the uh, the gamma prime delta inverse gamma matrix sort of for this augmented uh, moment factor with the, uh, in terms of the augmented uh, uh, parameter factor. And so, um, so there's, there's two points to this. Sort of one is, is to understand that any result that, uh, that therefore is established for the just identified case can directly be translated into the, the over-identified case. For example, the validity of, uh, of bootstrapping um, and, uh, and other methods. But it also sort of shows you sort of where the arbitrary nature is of, uh, of, this, uh, uh, of the estimator, in the, of this two-step estimator. If we change the matrix C here, we're not going to change the asymptotic distribution of theta under the condition that uh, on the, the condition that all these moments are valid, but in general, changing C is going to change the value for beta. It's going to change the value for lambda, and working through th all the other parameters, it's going to change the value for the, the limiting value for uh, uh, for theta. Um, final comment on that, and that, that sort of is the the point that will lead us into uh, empirical likelihood. Uh, um, uh, Gary Chamberlain showed that, uh, that this is, uh, two step GMM estimator is in fact efficient. So not just in the, uh, within the class of estimators that minimize the quadratic form, so the, this 
it's not just the weight matrix is the optimal one in that class, but in fact it's efficient within the class of all estimators that exploit the full set of, uh, of moment conditions. And uh, Chamberlain's argument is, is, uh, is a very interesting one uh, there. And that, that's really the, the link to the empirical likelihood. He said, well, let's suppose that we actually have a parametric distribution for, uh, for the random variables here. And let's suppose that we have a very flexible uh, parametric distribution, namely a discrete one with a very large uh, number of points of support, uh, capital L. Suppose we know these points of support, and the only thing we don't know is the, is the pi's. Then, given that uh, parametric setup, we can estimate the pi's by maximum likelihood, namely just calculate the, the proportion of the sample observations at each of these points. We can calculate the implied maximum likelihood for theta, namely by uh, uh, sort of invariance of maximum, well, that is defined implicitly in terms of these, uh, these pi's. And then that estimator for theta must be efficient, because it's a maximum likelihood estimator, uh, and sort of by the, the, the efficiency results for maximum likelihood, there must be uh, the efficient estimator for theta. And so what he showed then is if you do that, if you uh, look at the Kramer rao bound for theta in this parametric model, you get, in fact, back the variance-covariance matrix of the GMM estimator, this gamma delta inverse gamma inverted uh, matrix. And so given that we know the maximum likelihood estimator is efficient, the fact that it has the same variance-covariance matrix as the GMM estimator means the latter must be efficient too. And so that, that's sort of a very important result in its own right, but it's, um, it's sort of even more interesting in the light of the, the subsequent um, empirical likelihood literature. And so let, let's sort of take this uh, Chamberlain uh, argument a step a little further. Uh, and so let's, let's look at a very simple case here but there's actually no unknown uh, parameters. Uh, suppose you have a random sample uh, from some unknown distribution. If you're interested in estimating the distribution function uh, for, that, uh, for, the, for Z, the, the natural, sort of pretty much the only choice, is just to use the empirical distribution function. What does the empirical distribution function correspond to? It's essentially a, discrete, a distribution corresponding to a discrete random variable that puts mass 1 over n on each of the n uh, sample points. That's what the empirical distribution function uh, is, and that's sort of the most sensible way of, uh, of estimating that. But now suppose that we also know that the expected value of c is equal to 0. The empirical distribution function uh, doesn't satisfy that restriction. So putting, on, putting weights 1 over n on each of the n sample observations uh, doesn't give you a distribution that has expectation zero unless the, the sample average of, C, of disease is exactly equal to zero. But in general, the empirical distribution function wouldn't satisfy that, uh, that condition. And so the idea behind empirical likelihood is to modify these weights uh, a little bit to ensure that the estimated distribution function satisfies, in this case, the restriction that the expected value of C is equal to zero. And so it's essentially saying, if we don't know anything about this distribution of C, our best way of estimating that is just putting mass 1 over n on each of the sample observations. But if we know that the expectation of C is zero, we've got to be able to do better than that. We've got to, we should only look in the class of distributions that actually has exactly expectation zero. And so we now... Nah, we're still going to end up in, uh, pretty much through the, same, through the same mechanism as the way we got the empirical distribution. We're still going to end up with a distribution that only puts mass on the, on the sample points, but now we're going to modify these weights a little bit to keep them as close to 1 over n as possible, but to ensure that the, the mean of that implied distribution is exactly equal to, uh, to 0. And so the way... Um, to do that, that's sort of one, one mechanism for, for doing that. 
is to write down what is known as the empirical likelihood. It's just a product for all observations of pi i, defined for all pi's between 0 and 1, such that pi's add up to, to 1, and then maximize that empirical likelihood function subject to the restriction that the expected value of c under that distribution is 0, subject to the restriction that the pi's multiplied by c i add up to, uh, to 0. And so it's this one typo here. The, here I took the log of the empirical likelihood function, so I should have ended up with the log of the, the pi i's, not the, so you should be maximizing the sum of all observations of the log of pi i, subject to the restriction that these pi's add up to 1, so that they have proper distribution, and subject to the restriction that the pi's multiplying c i add up to 0. Now, if we didn't have that second restriction, we would just get uh, 1 over n for each of the pi's, and we would end up with the empirical distribution. But the second restriction forces them a bit away from 1 over n, but in, in typically a very minor way, but in a way that makes sure that, uh, that an adding up restriction is, uh, is satisfied. And so you, you can actually concentrate out the, um, the pi's, and you can write them as 1 over 1 plus, uh, uh, sort of actually, um, that, that's sort of a, that's not quite right either. Um, here, the solution should n times pi i hat should be equal to 1 over 1 plus t times c i. So the, or there should be an n in the denominator there, where the t times c i is how much you move away from the, from the 1 over n, where this t solves is the Lagrange multiplier from, uh, from that restriction. So, so in this case, where there's actually no unknown parameters, uh, the idea is that we look for, an for, the, for a distribution function that puts mass on all the sample observations in such a way that all the restrictions are satisfied. In this case, the restriction is that the sum of the pi i times ci is equal to zero. In general, the way you would do that, uh, and so at least here the, the log is there for the pi, but now actually the, the subscript i is missing. Um, this is one of the latest set of, sets of notes I was, uh, I was finishing. Uh, um, so in general, when we uh, have a set of moment conditions, we now maximize this empirical likelihood function, which, has, which is not affected by this DMM setup, subject to two sets of restrictions. The first still the, the adding up restriction, and the second now saying that there has to be a value of theta such that pi times theta, time, sorry, it has to be a value of theta, such that pi times psi evaluated at ci and theta adds up to zero. And so we're going to look, we're going to look for the distribution function as close as possible to the empirical distribution function, such that the restrict that all the restrictions are actually satisfied, such as there is a theta, such that all these restrictions are actually satisfied. It turns out that was it the, the key results uh, are that if you do this, if you maximize this over theta and pi, you end up with an uh, estimator for theta that is equivalent to first order to the two-step uh, GMM estimator. And moreover, sort of, but sort of what you gain, so that, that's just back to, the, to where we were, but the gain is that for many purposes, the likelihood function here, the, which is not quite a regular likelihood function with more observations, we're going to get more parameters in there. But for many purposes, the empirical likelihood function has the same properties as a parametric likelihood function. Uh, we're going to be able to do likelihood ratio tests, uh, score tests, wall tests, and, um, and, this, and sort of in fact, there's higher order corrections possible. There's a lot of machinery known from maximum likelihood estimation that we can actually uh, bring to bear on, uh, on the empirical likelihood uh, uh, setup. Now, um, 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 actually, so let, let me uh, generalize this a little bit. Uh, so this is sort of, that was one for, that was the, the empirical likelihood estimator. There's a more general class in fact, there's two more general classes of, of estimators uh, uh, that are useful to consider. Uh, and so here's one way 
of doing that based on something that is known as the cressy reed discrepancy statistic uh, define, this defines a way, this defines a uh, distance between two distributions. Uh, so if you have two factors, P and Q, both of the same dimension, uh, both of dimension N, if these factors are the same, this would give you, uh, uh, irrespective of the value of lambda, this would give you a value for this function I of, uh, of zero. If these functions differs, differ, this gives you a way of measuring how different they are. And so for any choice uh, lambda, we can minimize the discrepancy between the empirical distribution and the estimated distribution subject to the same restrictions uh, as before. And so what, what this is doing is, is changing the metric a little bit for maximum likelihood uh, by, uh, by, allowing the, the, by allowing different forms for, for this metric. Now, why is this useful? Uh, one is that uh, empirical likelihood is actually a special case of this uh, where we let uh, lambda go to, uh, to zero. But there's other, uh, actually, let me first uh, go to, uh, uh, two other estimators in this class. There's two other estimators in this class that are actually very, uh, uh, very useful. If we take lambda as two in this, uh, this cressy read uh, statistic, then we end up with an estimator that, uh, that independently, yeah, or that, that originally pro was proposed by Hansen, Heaton, and your own. It sort of looks very much like the standard GMM setup, but where instead of uh, max minimizing the quadratic form given a weight matrix, they simultaneously minimize the quadratic form over theta in the average moments and over theta in the weight matrix. And so that's another way of getting around sort of this, this awkwardness that you need an initial estimate and depending on what, where you start uh, partly determines where you end up. Here you do the minimization, you, you update the weight matrix uh, as you go along, as you change the value of theta, which is why they call it the, this, the continuously updating estimator. But it turns out it fits into this, uh, uh, this class of, of empirical likelihood estimators. So now, um, going back to the original order of the slides. So there's another way of, of setting up this, this general framework uh, uh, following work by Richard Smith, and uh, in particular, there's a paper by, by Newey and Smith that, uh, that shows, uh, that, that obtains some results uh, for this, this overall class where you write the general problem as a, as a settle point uh, problem and that includes sort of both the empirical likelihood and the, the continuous updating estimators as, uh, as special cases, namely corresponding to particular uh, functions uh, G. Um, I can make, it's actually here is one other estimator that has sort of, uh, is one of the three that's actually been, uh, been used a fair amount. If you take uh, lambda going to uh, minus one in the, the cressy read statistic, uh, you end up uh, minimizing something that uh, looks more like the kublik leibler criterion than the, the likelihood function. And the advantage of that is uh, um, that it, it has some computational advantages where the implicit probabilities are, are guaranteed to be uh, non-negative. Um, so, as I said in the introduction, uh, the, the much bigger difference is between the, the two-step estimators and, and the, the whole class of generalized empirical likelihood estimators. Uh, but uh, within that class, there tend to be relatively minor differences. But the main theoretical issue being that uh, empirical likelihood coming from its close ties to uh, likelihood theory uh, has higher order bias properties. Uh, and, uh, and so it has some theoretical advantages. Um, the continuously updating estimator uh, tends to have more computational difficulties, uh, and, uh, and the exponential tilting estimator tends to be computationally relatively uh, stable. But in practice, these differences are fairly uh, minor. Um, one more point. 
on, uh, on this, uh, and this uh, issue I raised earlier. Given that uh, the empirical likelihood is, uh, actually has a lot of the properties, so we, uh, earlier I made the point that the empirical likelihood actually has a lot of the properties of, uh, of a parametric likelihood. And so some of these properties are reflected in the, in the options for testing uh, restrictions here. And so uh, one way of doing that is just interpreting the empirical likelihood as a likelihood function and doing a likelihood ratio uh, uh, test, comparing the value of the likelihood at the unrestricted uh, estimates, where you just use the empirical distribution function, comparing that to the value of the log, -like log empirical likelihood function at the restricted estimates, uh, at the, the maximum likelihood estimates for, uh, for the pies. And that's going to have a chi-squared distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the number of over-identifying restrictions. Um, you can also do a wall test by directly comparing the average value of the moments to the, very similar to the DMM uh, setup. And you can do a Lagrange multiplier test for the restrictions, which uh, corresponds to the Lagrange multipliers for the... Um, for the... the for these restrictions. So when we actually uh, do this uh, along the way, you get Lagrange multipliers for, for all these uh, restrictions, and they feed into that uh, uh, Lagrange multiplier test. And just as in the standard uh, parametric likelihood setting, all three of these tests are going to be first order equivalent uh, uh, and have the same chi-square distribution with degrees of freedom equal to the number of over-identifying restrictions. Um, um, so setting it up the way I did uh, uh, initially, so they involved uh, lots more parameters than just the unknown theta. In principle, this introduced uh, for, uh, an additional parameter for each observation, namely this, uh, this pi i, uh, where now with n observations, we have n additional uh, parameters. Uh, so there's certainly that, that would seem to raise a big concern about computational uh, issues. You wouldn't want to maximize a, func a minimum, maximize a function with, uh, with n parameters. Uh, it turns out that is, uh, that is not quite as big a problem uh, as it uh, may seem. You can, first of all, concentrate out the, um, the pies in terms of the Lagrange multipliers. Given the Lagrange multipliers, there's going to be an explicit solution for the pies, so that reduces the computational problem to one where the dimension is uh, the same as the dimension of theta plus the, dimension, the number of, uh, of moment conditions, which gives you the number of, uh, of Lagrange multiplier conditions, the, the number of Lagrange multipliers. So at that point, uh, just solving the first order conditions, uh, like in, the, um, in this generalized empirical likelihood uh, setup, uh, trying to solve the, solve the first order conditions uh, for T and, uh, and theta doesn't work very well. Um, at some point, there was some suggestion using penalty functions that doesn't uh, work particularly well either. What, um, what seems to work best uh, is, uh, is a suggestion by uh, Mittal, Hammer, Judge, and Schoenberg, uh, who suggests concentrating out the Lagrange multipliers and then uh, optimizing over theta without any uh, constraints. And so partly the reason that works out very well is that solving for the Lagrange multipliers is typically a very easy problem. Uh, and th so this is where this, uh, the particular case of, uh, of exponential tilting is particularly easy. For a fixed value of theta, minimizing the objective function over the Lagrange multipliers is just a strictly convex problem. And so there's, there's very easy uh, first and second derivatives. You can do this very fast. So for a given value of theta, you can uh, solve for t uh, uh, very, very quickly. Then uh, you can uh, maximize over theta, having concentrated out uh, t at any particular value of, of, uh, of theta. And in fact, and so the, going beyond the uh, Mittelhammer uh, Judge Schoenberg paper, you can actually calculate these derivatives, the derivatives of this objective function with respect to theta analytically because even though t is defined implicitly here, you can still uh, get an analytic derivative uh, for that function. 
And so you end up with something that uh, where the, the first derivatives are fairly straightforward to calculate, and uh, and this this actually seems to work uh, very well. And uh, in fact, I think there's actually some packages out there that uh, that implement uh, these things. Uh, so I think the sort of mainly Gauss and, and MATLAB uh, packages. Okay, so let me uh, uh, just show you uh, some of the, the implications of this uh, in this um, in, in the context of this uh, dynamic panel data model uh, that I gave before. So we have a, an individual permanent component uh, eta i, or fixed effect eta i. We're interested in the, the coefficient on the lagged uh, dependent variable. We get a, a two sets of moment conditions, uh, one coming from the, the correlations between the lags and the, the difference in the outcomes and the lagged outcomes, and the, the second set coming from the, the stationarity assumption. Then um, what I did, uh, what I did uh, to see how well these things work, I took uh, some data from, uh, from a paper by, by John About and, uh, and David Card, where they had earnings uh, for 1,400 individuals for 11 years. Uh, and so, um, but I was interested in seeing how, how well these different, uh, they, they actually used the minimum distance estimator, just use, first estimating the covariances uh, unrestrictedly. But I was interested in this comparing these uh, method of moments estimators and empirical likelihood estimators and seeing how well they did in cases with large degrees of over-identification. So once we have a fair number of, uh, of years, you get a high degree of, uh, of over-identification. So I estimated the, the data generating so that all the variances of the different uh, components on the ABIT card data um, with the, the variance of the idiosyncratic term around 0.3 as well as the variance of the fixed effect about uh, 0.3. And then I simulated these data both for theta 0.5 and theta 0.9. I think the 0.5 is, is very close to what a and card, what you get on the a and card uh, data. And so here, um, I just reported, um, so I also varied the number of time periods to see how much, how, how things would deteriorate with the degree of, uh, of over-identification. So first here the, are some results for the, the um, case where theta is, uh, is 0.5. Um, and so what you see here is that these things don't make much difference. Uh, both in the two-step GMM and, and the exponential tilting estimate I calculated here both do very well. Coverage rates for the... Um, 90 and 95% confidence intervals are very close to nominal ones, uh, uh, and the, the abs median absolute error is very similar in, uh, in both cases. That uh, changes considerably if you look at a case where the degree of uh, persistence is much higher. So if you look at a case where theta is 0.9, now you see... Now, in some sense, that's, that's going to lower the, the degree of, uh, it's, that, that's going weak, to weaken the, the effect of the moment conditions. And so you get closer to settings where the, the moment conditions have very little uh, influence. And now you see um, the two-step GMM estimator deteriorating considerably uh, when you use a uh, large number of moment conditions. Uh, by the time uh, we use 11 uh, uh, years of data, the coverage rate for the 90% the confidence interval is 75%, uh, 76%, whereas for the, the, the exponential tilting estimator, the coverage rate stays much, uh, much higher, both for the 90 and the 95% uh, confidence interval. And so this is sort of, in the end, uh, uh, consistent with all the, the instrumental variables uh, to the weak instrument findings, once uh, and sort of consistent with these theoretical results in, uh, in Newey and, uh, and Smith, that with large degrees, large degrees of over-identification, these two-step uh, estimators have considerably uh, 
poorer properties uh, than, the, than this whole class of, uh, of empirical likelihood um, estimators. So, um, sort of from a theoretical point of view, and sort of, uh, in particular, sort of based on this, uh, well, sort of based partly on the Newey Smith results where they established formal uh, bias properties for these empirical likelihood estimators that are much better than for a two step uh, GMM. But partly based on the fact that there's this arbitrariness in the in the two-step GMM estimator that can just be avoided uh, by using these um, uh, empirical likelihood estimators, the sort of theoretical on theoretical grounds, there's sort of clear reason to uh, to prefer the, these empirical likelihood estimators, uh, especially given that the and in combination with the fact that the computational issues are not. Um, uh, that the computational differences are not all that big anymore. Uh, that, that is sort of what my recommendation would be there. All right. I think uh, th this, this is it. Any, uh, <laughs> uh, I think we do actually have to stop on time here because they, they, they're using the room for a different function uh, later. Uh, but are there any questions uh, here? Uh, thank you.